Hey everybody, welcome back to another Deep Astronomy live stream slash train wreck. My name is Tony Darnell from Deep Astronomy, and today I thought we would talk about the Dark Ages, the early universe, the very first stars that ever shined in the whole ever. And it's an interesting time in the universe, but then as I got to making the slides for today, I ended up kind of going, well, you know what? We don't know a lot about this time in the universe. And how are we going to learn more? Well, of course, that's the big thing JWST is going to do for us. So I've got a whole section in here on all the instruments on JWST and how they're going to help us understand this period in the universe. So uh, it's kind of a dual hangout thing where we, we talk both about the dark ages and reionization, what that is. And, and, then, we, and then I have a section on all of the uh, JWST instruments, which I may end up using as a highlight for a standalone uh, upload that does uh, that does what we had talked about doing several times in these in these hangouts. So I'm glad you're here. I am streaming on YouTube, Twitter, blah, 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 all of the all of that crap, and um, and so please, uh, the format is. In case you've never watched one of these before, I pick a topic, in this case, the Dark Ages, and then we go through uh, some slides to get the kind of the sage, stage set. And then after I'm done, we chat amongst ourselves. And if you want, you can certainly interact with all the chat clients that are out there on all the platforms because I, I have them uh, streaming through here. Uh, but you could also go to the Discord server, which is in the description box, and also Stream Elements is posting invites uh, on that on Twitch. So by all means, go there and go into the li the voice uh, channel for the live stream. If you go there and if you have a microphone, in a minute I'm going to turn it on and we can chat, we can talk. So I'll take a look at that in just a little bit. But that's on the Discord server. I really like Discord. It's one of the few social media platforms that exists so far that hasn't, at least as far as I know, started taking all of our personal data. <laughs> they probably are, or at least they will be soon. But for now, Discord is a relatively uh, protected place to be. So I really like being there. And I'm seeing a lot of you guys already on the chat. So welcome. I'm glad you guys are here. Um, Pyro's here. Uh, Galaxia is here, and John Suff, all you guys, Dan, good friends. You guys are starting to become my friend. I know you better than I know some people in real life, <laughs> so it feels good to see you there. Dennis and Dan on Twitch and Galaxia on YouTube. It's really good to see you. Of course, Peter's here. <clears throat> uh, so it's really, uh, it's really a good, good, I don't know, man, it's just fun. I like doing this because it is a connection. It is a community instead of a cult. So I really like doing this. So welcome, guys. It's good to see you. And uh, if you have any questions or comments about this, then by all means, you know, pipe up and I'll go through. Uh, Galaxy always shows you guys how to do the little question mark thing. I think it's a colon and then a QU and then it pops a big red question mark. It shows up on the on the chat, at least on YouTube. I don't know if the, how that works on, on Twitch. Uh, and Facebook, poor old Facebook. You know how I discovered how I could get more views on Facebook? All I have to do is start a live stream with the title, NASA Proves Flat Earth. <laughs> then, not only will Facebook let it go, and I'll get lots of views, but Facebook will also promote it, because we all know that they love the interaction, and everybody interacts with stuff that just is wrong. So if I wanted to boost my views on Facebook, that's what I should do. I don't know. What do you guys think? NASA proves a flat earth or aliens are being hidden by an area 51. Something like that would definitely take off on Facebook because they love that stuff. <laughs> I only, well, you know, Dan, Dennis, I only, I only stream there cause I can, it's a button. <laughs> so it goes to my deep astronomy page. Other than that, I don't care. Uh, some people, one or two people sometimes comment from there, but nobody knows about me because it does their, their algorithm is, not tuned to uh, correct in, 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 in reality, actually. Okay, so um, enough of that. Let's get started. I made some slides, like I always do. And hey, Ebone, it's good to see you. And uh, what did Darnell mean? You ought to explain. What I don't quite. What, I'm not sure what you mean by that, Pyro. If you could, if you could uh, 
uh, elaborate. I'll, I'll follow up with that in just a bit. Um, okay, so the Dark Ages. This is a period in the universe that is very interesting, in my opinion. It is... Uh, hey, Hans, it's good to see you. Um, here's what we're talking about. This is a nice little graphic I found on NASA's website. Um, we know, you, you hear cosmologists talk a lot about the early universe, and people like Sean Carroll et al., they all say that we know, we have a pretty good idea about the history of the uh, universe uh, up to about a second after the Big Bang. Everything else is pretty, um, uh, everything else after that is pretty well known. That one second, we still have a lot of work to do. But there really is a that there really is a lot more that we could learn about this period not too long after the Big Bang, particularly about three hundred and eighty thousand years after the Big Bang. So in this, you can see that here in this little graphic off to the right, that, that this marks a uh, a time in our universe's history uh, just after what we see in the cosmic microwave background, where the universe uh, has expanded and it's cooled enough so that the Atoms that were in the and the subatomic particles that were in the early universe here, this this ionized gas right up here and in, in towards the top. This is where the cosmic microwave background lives. Um, it was so dense and so hot during this time that the uh, atoms, any any electron or any photon that went uh, any kind of distance at all, was immediately scattered and hit somewhere else. Which meant that if photons can't get out then that's an opaque surface, right? It's black. You can't get to get through. And so that's how they, this, this period here, we have no hope of ever seeing with observations because there is nothing to really see. There's, it's just too dense in there. But as the universe cooled a little bit more, uh, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, uh, the, there was enough space and where these photons could finally break free without being scattered. Then the universe became transparent. Those subatomic particles were uh, came together, protons and neutrons and electrons came together to form neutral hydrogen and helium. And that makes up this basic, and that makes up a big part or, or it makes up the, the universe at this time. So we have a neutral, set of uh, atoms here, mostly hydrogen and helium, uh, and photons can begin to travel. But the problem now is it has gotten so dense and or so diffuse that the um, we had to wait for stuff to clump together so that they could begin to heat up. And, the, and there was, so nothing was really glowing in here. Nothing was shining. No, there was just neutral hydrogen, neutral hydrogen all by itself unless you're looking at 21 centimeters, uh, it doesn't really radiate very much, right? So you hit, uh, it's, it's called the dark ages for that reason. But over time, quite a bit of time, a few hundred million years, little clumps of this material, this neutral hydrogen starts to bump in and glow and get hot and radiate a little bit. And this radiation, as it radiated, started uh, to... Re Reionize, ionize these neutral atoms again. And, and ionizing means to give it a charge. An, an ion has a charge. And the only way you can really get a uh, ionized thing of hydrogen is to slip away, or is to strip away its electron, and now it's positively charged because it doesn't have an electron. Uh, and so if you were to add an extra electron, it would become negatively charged. But it is so these these electrons are being stripped from these neutral atoms, and that's called reionization. Things were ionized up here, but they and but then they clumped together down here uh, for many hundreds of millions of years, and now things are starting to glow. The very first stars are starting to form, and the radiation from those is starting to reionize the elements that are there. So now we have charged particles floating around everywhere. And so up to about a billion years, there's not a whole lot of uh, observations uh, from this line back. Uh, we, we do know the cosmic microwave background because of Planck and other instruments like, or things that study the, the CMB, but there's a big dearth of observations 
in between. In this region here, between about a billion and nine billion years after the Big Bang, there is uh, quite a bit of observations from a lot of space telescopes. And when we say we're talking about reionization, we're talking mostly about hydrogen. You can ionize helium, true, but uh, mostly we're talking about the, um, uh, the, ion the ionization of hydrogen. And um, the expansion continued, of course, until it left all this hydrogen that we still see today, this ionized hydrogen we can still see. So the first stars that formed were really bizarre. They were all of these things. I found these really great graphics on NASA, so I put them all together. Um, they are, they were very big compared to the sun, mostly made of hydrogen and helium, as you can see here. They didn't have much else. Uh, the uh, our sun is compared; it's compared to our sun in this smaller graphic up here, where we have where our sun has seventy one percent hydrogen, some helium, and then two percent of everything else. There were some trace amounts of lithium in some of the early stars, but they were very blue, very large and very hot. Um, they're, they're, this little thermometer here shows how bright they are compared to the sun. They're very bright um, and they were also much bluer um, than the sun was. And then in this panel, you can see they're also way more massive. One of these first stars would have taken all these other stars. There are many, many hundreds of times the solar mass, um, of the, the mass of our sun. And they didn't live very long either. This bottom panel shows them, they basically live, uh, you know, just, I mean, they, they blew this up. There's a, there's the, you know, over a 10 billion lifespan of our sun. Our sun's going to run about 10 billion years. We're somewhere along here right now in the, in the, in the middle, uh, 5 billion years. But this little tiny blue sliver here is how long these stars lived compared with the sun. The sun, not very long. Okay, they had about they lasted about a million years. That's fast for a star like this. So they burned bright, they burned hot, and they were big. So they didn't last very long. And here's some more graphics I found. Oh, I, I put the mass one up twice. <laughs> um, and uh, and the temperature that we should probably look at this part here. I put the temperature in twice too. So the temperature was a lot harder, hotter as well um, than the first than the sun. Um, and of course, they were um, blue, primarily blue light. Uh, they had burned very hot, blue giant stars, and they had a lot of um, ionization coming out of them. Right, this is the reionization part of the first stars. A lot of, if um, if a planet were in orbit around one of these stars, uh, ultraviolet light, or I'm sorry, what am I saying? This is a um, hydrogen atom. And if UV light from that hits it, uh, this is an electron, that's a proton, uh, and it will strip that away. That's how ionization occurs. That's what we mean by ionization. So that's a little bit about the very first stars ever to shine. And we've seen these in various observations of uh, uh, lensed galaxies and things like that, but we we don't have a lot of really good observations of this, and that's what JWST is going to help us with. Because looking back this far is really, really hard. Um, everything that existed in this time in the universe was redshifted um, pretty far, but you know, uh, it's, it's got a pretty high redshift, which means that um, we need to look at this region of the sky in the infrared. This is why everybody is excited about infrared astronomy, because this is the region where you're going to see uh, all of this uh, stuff in the early universe. And right now, the best way we look at it is we use quasars to teach us about this early, uh, this early time in the universe. Now I put this graph up here. Um, and I'll explain it in just a sec. It's an animated GIF. And so we use quasars because of the brightest we, things we can ever see. And they were around back then. They were, they were around back in the early universe. And red shifts, it turns out, will tell us a lot about when they are shown. We see red, we see we see quasars all over the place, but there's a difference in their in their uh red shifts that give us a clue about whether they existed during the period of reionization or after. And it turns out this little animated GIF is how you know. There's this thing called a Gunn-Peterson trough. 
that that's all I know about it. But if there's a picture of it right there in those areas where it says zero flux, that is a trough. And if a, and if a redshift or, or if a spectra from a from a quasar has that trough in it, has that zero flux trough, then that means it went through a lot of neutral hydrogen, which means it went through a time when the period when uh, there the, through the dark ages or or at least right immediately after that went through a lot of neutral hydrogen. So a trough means it's a very old quasar, and no trough means that it's a pretty recent and relatively closer quasar. So this is one of the tools that astronomers use to decide when, by looking at these redshifts, they can see when the period of ionization, reionization was. And I know that's a little bit weird, that thing, and if you can't really see it, it's all right. There's just a, the big, the big big trough right here is this one in the um, Lyman beta uh, lines where it's, there's a definite trough there. I guess that's a trough, but I can't see it as much. So, so to really get the, uh, we need more observations of this time period because this is basically the big one, right? This is the big observation that we currently have. Oops. So let's talk about JWST then. Because really, <laughs> I, we talk a lot of shit about it, and we are we're a little bit um, we're a little bit jaded about this this telescope. But it really is going to help us with this time with this time in the universe. So let's take a look then at the instruments on JWST. Here's a graph I've shown you guys this before of where uh, JWST will look back in time, and in, and uh, this goes back into the time of the. Uh, uh, the period of reionization. Um, Hubble can go pretty far, but not, but it, and it needs a lot of help from gravitational lensing to get back this far. But this is, this is uh, the comparative um, time scale of when the JWST will be looking. So the, the, all of the instruments, there are four of them on JWST and they're all located right here in the back of the back plane of the primary. This is the back side of JWST here in this left panel. And this box contains all the goodies. They call this the payload. <laughs> this is the reason for JWST to exist. Uh, these other things, you see the, the, the cooling, the passive cooling heat shield. You see solar panels here. There's a spacecraft bus that does all the power, powering and stuff. The momentum flap keep, you know, provides torque against the solar wind, or at least over help compensates for that torque. And so, but everything is in this little backpack that JWST wears. And over on the right is a schematic of where they're all laid out. Uh, the mounting system for the back plane is on the bottom. This is, it's, this is the back, this is the straps of the backpack. And there's where there's the mid infrared, uh, instrument. There's a fine guidance sensor. There's the near infrared camera and the near-infrared spectrometer. That's the four main instru instruments that are going to be on the James Webb Space Telescope. And I've shown you this before, too, but here's their wavelength range. Um, you can see the, the near-infrared versus the mid-infrared. Most of the instruments, three of the four instruments, are going to be looking for about at about 0.8 to 5 microns. That's the, that's the near-infrared. Uh, very interesting time uh, for... Uh, a very interesting wavelength range for this time in the universe. And MIRI will go way out. It's the mid infrared will go way out to roughly 25 microns. So, um, uh, and down here's a little schematic of what you can see the near infrared. You can see cool stars and dust is transparent to that, which is important because you want to be able to see through a lot of the crap. And then mid infrared shows you things like planets, comets, asteroids, uh, dust swarms by starlight and protoplanetary disks. It, it, it does not go through the dust. <clears throat> so let's start with the near cam. This is the camera, the near infrared camera. It's got 10 Mercury cadmium telluride. So a Mercad, they call it Mercad tell uh, detectors. I worked with these uh, when I was at the High Altitude Observatory. Uh, they are very sensitive to the infrared, and it's got a wavefront sensor that can sense and correct for any errors in the telescope optics. Remember, the main primary mirror of JWST has got these hexagonal segments all over the place that can each be. Uh, 
moved and and uh they have little uh uh little sensors on them that they can and and, and actuators that move it move each one of those segments around um and this is necessary because the, all 18 segments have to work together uh as a giant single mirror and so this wave front sensor helps to um go past um or, or it helps to put all that optical uh, wavelength strength together near spec now this is the most exciting instrument on in my opinion on this telescope and it's all about them micro shutters on here is a picture of the micro micro shutter array over the detector this is the micro shutters on the on the right in the top panel is a closer up view of that array but look down here at the bottom this is a little pencil sized pointer thingy that they're pushing down one of the micro shutters with that they can each be actuated this was a big deal to make this was also very hard had to be invented nothing like this exists anywhere in any telescope in the world this is the first time this has been done and what this allows you to do is this is this focal plane this is the image array this is the detector plane of the detector and if there's a bright star or anything that you want to just block out, you can do that by just closing the shutters in that region and that region only, allowing the light to hit the rest of the detector from a very dim thing, right? And then it sends that light from that very dim thing through an etalon, which is a way to, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, um, it's not an etalon. It's the other kind of uh, spectrograph. Um, shoot it. The name is, is escaping me now, but, um, it's a grading, a gra it's a grading. That's what it is. And it goes to that, uh, to produce a spectrum. And this is the, the, uh, one of the premier, if not the premier instrument, the one everybody's excited to use because of these micro shutters. And here's the kind of data it's going to put out. This is a simulated image. Actually, it's not simulated. This is an actual near cam. I'm sorry, near spec output using the onboard calibration lamps that they have. To calibrate the spectrometer, they need to uh, put a, a calibration, a known wavelength uh, into the instrument so that they can make sure they're getting the right absorption lines and where they need to be. And this is the kind of spectrum that you can get from a star or from the reflection of a planet uh, that may be in orbit around a star, as well as these very first stars in the universe. We're going to be able to see these kinds of spectra. And um, this was, you can see there's two detectors. Uh, there is broken up into two main squares. Those are the two main detectors. And of course, like I just said, the micro shutters can be open and closed to block out anything that's not wanted. I mean, to me, this is, this is cool. This is cool as hell because to see, to get this kind of spectra, uh, where you can block out the brighter things and see the dimmer things is going to not only help exoplanet search, but be able to get other stars and even galaxies, their spectra. So this is output from the near spec. Okay, let's move on to MIRI. Now, remember I showed you MIRI is that when, that real wide wavelength one, right? It's going to go all the way up to about 20 microns. It's got the largest wavelength range. It's made of three arsenic-doped silicon uh, detector arrays. Um, it's got uh, it's going to provide wide-field broadband imagery, so it's got a camera, as well as a spectrograph that will have medium-resolution spectroscopy over a smaller field of view compared with the, with the imager. Uh, it's got to operate, and this is one of the things that uh, that had to be also uh, kind of invented, it operates at 7 Kelvin. This is cooler than the other instruments, and passive cooling, that heat shield, or the, yeah, the heat shield, like, no, the sun shield, they keep calling it, I forget what they call it, but those five, those five uh, tennis court sized um, mylar uh, radiators uh, are not good enough. That's going to get it down to about 30, Kelvin, but you, there needs to be an additional thermal management system put onto this camera to get it down to seven Kelvin. So that's the MIRI instrument. Then finally, we've got the fine guidance sensor and the, I, 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 I had to, uh, what is it called? Near infrared and uh, near infrared uh, 
slitless imager and slitless spectrometer. That's what that is. And this allows Webb, well, the fine guidance sensor points the telescope. It's the, it's the guider, right? It's, it, if you're using a telescope in your backyard, it's the auto guider. Um, and it's, uh, you know, this is so that Webb can have long exposure, high quality photos. Uh, the near infrared imager and slitless spectrograph, which is a mouthful, uh, is going to, is also going to be part of, uh, exoplanet detection, characterization and transit spectroscopy. So this one is going to be used a lot, uh, for, you know, sort of the, the, uh, uh, medium, um, range spectro spectrographs that it's going to take. It's got a wavelength range of 0.8 to 5 microns, just like the other instruments. And it's um, it's got three main modes, each of which addresses a separate wavelength range. Um, so without this, James Webb doesn't point. Uh, and the slitless imager and slitless spectrometer, this was built by Canada, by the way. This was the contribution from Canada. So Dan, your countryman, gave us this. So thank you. Uh, well, I didn't give it to us, but you know, you guys built it. So the, you guys are responsible for this JWST pointing. <laughs> if it doesn't point, man, we're going to be blaming Canadians on this. Just saying. Okay. And I think that's my last slide. Oh, no, no. So here we go. Here's why I think it's my last slide here. So JWST observations are going to look straight into the dark ages here. We have this in the on the far right here, this graphic that NASA made where um, you can kind of see the quasar area, helium reionization, hydrogen reionization, way all the way down into this dark ages region. It's going to be able to see. Uh, and we have very few observations for this time period. And here's just another timeline, this one here, um, that I thought was a little bit clearer than some of the others I've seen. Um, you can see the Big Bang here and then the cosmic microwave background uh, where recombination occurs. And then the dark ages happen. That's where you have all this neutral atoms sitting around, floating around, not doing much of anything. And several hundred million years later, um, the first stars begin to form, begin to clump together and heat up and start to reionize all of the stuff that came later. The radiation was stripping off uh, the electrons from the protons uh, in hydrogen. And this is the period of reionization. And during this period, those first stars clumped into the first galaxies. And in many billions of years later, the sun forms. So I thought this was a pretty good little graphic to end with because it shows what astronomers are pretty comfortable with right now as far as the history of the universe. Things back here behind this big purple thing, I think is a, a source of a lot of consternation for cosmology the, uh, theorists. Um, there, as far as I know, we don't have much hope of observing this time period. Um, it is too opaque. And because photons don't travel very far. I've heard, I heard Avi Loeb say that if you use the 22 centimeter line of hydrogen, you might get in behind this barrier just a little bit. But he didn't explain anything beyond that. Um, so it's possible we can get in a little bit here with observations, but basically this is a brick wall. We can't see past this um, because of the uh, opacity of the universe. So that's my little spiel. Boy, I'm getting pretty good at this, doing right about a half hour. And I know it turned into a JWST thing, but it is it dovetails perfectly with the um, with this topic because we don't have a lot of observations. There's not a lot I can show you. And the words I use to describe this time period is about all we can say about it. So, you know, I, I hope that um, that helps a little bit with some of this. Um, so I'm going to look at some of your chats and comments here. Um, let me see. Let me get my... Oh, by the way, you guys in... If you guys are in Discord, then you're looking at just my screen. I'm not turning on a thing. So let me... Um, okay. So I can hear you guys. If you're in there, uh, if you want, but you're not on the stream yet. So if you guys start talking and saying things... 
I will hear them. You don't have to. You can stay where you are um, if you'd rather do that. Um, Architufus, let me come see. Just need to create a supercomputer to calculate the answer to Big Bang, the universe, and everything. Yes, but we already know the answer, right? Thankfully, Douglas Adams did that for us. Um, Eduardo, oh man, so hoping this works out perfectly. So many questions to answer, but more importantly, so many new questions to be formed. Man, what a cool thing this is. Yes, I, all, everything you're saying is right. And of course, this is analogous to what happened with Hubble. When we launched Hubble, the main reason for launching it was to uh, get a better handle on Hubble's law and the cosmic, the rate of, 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 of cosmic uh, expansion. It did that within the first few years of it existing, but then all of this other stuff became a possibility. And of course, um, in the time that JWST had been conceived, I did a history of this a while back of the of this mission. Exoplanets didn't even exist. We are well, <laughs> we did not know that they existed. And so now they're thinking, well, gosh, is JWST going to be able to help us with looking at exoplanets? Turns out near spec is going to be ideal for this. Uh, near spec will be able to block out the light from the star that a planet may be in orbit around so that it can take a direct spectrum of the reflected light from that exoplanet and image it as well from Miri. So Miri can image it and uh, near spec can get the spectrum of it and we can learn a lot first about seeing a planet. We don't have many direct observations of smaller Earth-sized planets. So we do have, we, we, we've directly looked at Jupiter-sized planets, but that only works if we look at a planet that's about the size of Jupiter, and it's pretty far away from its star, such that when we look at it through microlensing or gravitational lensing, we can see it in the Einstein ring. So that's that's more than you wanted to know. But right now, that's about the only way we can directly image an exoplanet. JWST, but with that big primary, going to get right on it. Okay, so we'll be able to see these exoplanets directly by blocking out the light from that star, which is huge. Uh, we'll be able to to do this. So yeah, and and then of course there's the questions we don't even know that we need to ask once we start exploring and finding things out with JWST. Everybody complains that this is a infrared instrument only. Remember, it got descoped in 2007 to just only look at things that are less than uh, I think it was seven microns or something like that. Miri goes further, but you know the the main thing was you know below seven microns. Uh, and leave it there because these, you know, the, the costs were getting too high. But imagine if we had UV or if we had other other wavelength ranges. But infrared's good. Infrared's good enough, right? To, especially for getting these things out in the in this time in this time of the universe. So, yeah, man, this is going to be a totally amazing thing. Third rock, uh, Tony. What do you think? Will December eighteenth be the day? Or do you think it'll get pushed back to 2022? It's already in French Guyana. Okay, so here's what gives me hope. This last weekend, I think, the Ariane 5 was launched again from East, from uh, Ariane space. And it contained the largest um, payload ever done by a Ariane 5 rocket. It set some kind of record for the heaviest payload ever put. It was basically two satellites. And it went great. It went fine. And it went really well. So the issues that Ariane 5 had appear to have been worked out. So I no longer fear for the launch like I used to. And I do think now, after it's there and they've started their um, preparations for getting it on the rocket, they've taken it out of the container and they've got it vertical and they're starting to put fuel in the thing. I'm actually starting to think maybe, okay, this might go on the on the 18th. But I think at any minute now, I don't think they're going to do any more testing of this thing. I don't think they're going to touch it. So I think we're kind of committed at this point. I don't think, unless a bolt <laughs> falls off and they see it and, they, and they're walking around the, the floor and they go, uh, guys, what's this? You know, and <laughs> unless that happens, then I think we're probably going to go on the 18th. Or some kind of bullshit government thing happens where the government shuts down over budget stuff or something stupid like that happens, then it might get delayed, but that won't be NASA's fault. That'll be politicians fault. So that's a long answer to your question, but my answer is, I think it will actually go. 
Ebone. With such quality of spectra, we'll be able to remeasure the distances to faraway stars and therefore to reconfirm or recalculate the age of the universe. Also, of course, the speed of expansion, among other cool things. Yeah, I think all of that's going to be re, um, you know, re uh, enforcing what we've already measured. So, yes, I definitely think that's true. Um, let's see. Hey, man, if you guys want to block somebody, just do it. You, I got. I got moderators in here, so if somebody's causing you problems, get rid of them. Uh, I totally trust you guys. Okay, Dan, uh, were the early collapsed stars the seeds uh, of galaxy center black holes? Um, well, I don't know, but I can tell you this. They're finding black holes a lot earlier than they thought they would in this time period. Remember, the only telescope that can really get this far back is Hubble, and it needs a lot of help with gravitational lensing to see these things. But they're starting to see evidence via the quasars, I guess, um, that they formed big ones, supermassive black holes formed way earlier than everybody had thought in the universe. So... Um, so yes, I think those early collapsed stars were the seeds of some uh, supermassive black holes. <clears throat> Pyro, uh, is there a possibility of first stars being bigger than anything even possible today thanks to greater average density? I did hear read glimpses of the possibility for direct collapse into black holes only. <clears throat> yes, the I think, I think, I don't know if the only thing that's given me pause is this part about something, anything even possible today. They were most definitely bigger, brighter. They were super giants, almost all of them. And this, the, you know, these, these, these coalescing of, of neutral hydrogen um, into these stars was like gasoline for these stars, right? It just burned hot and bright and fast. And so uh, they were definitely bigger. Um, and I, they, they, when they blew up, when they, because they were super giants, they exploded and they exploded in a core collapse supernova, which would have been a direct collapse, the direct collapse into a black hole. Right? That's what a core collapse is, right? I mean, all stars, when they die, their cores collapse. The, the only difference is where they stop. And that's dictated by its mass. A star like our sun will stop at the white dwarf stage. That's electron degeneracy. That's where the electron pressure is holding up the core. Otherwise, you know, the core collapses. It squeezes all the atoms together. The electron pressure of those atoms holds it up. But if the star is bigger than our sun, then the electrons can't hold it up. And it squeezes even more so that the neutrons are holding it up. That's neutron degeneracy. That's a neutron star. They're, you know, several hundred times smaller than a white dwarf. If the star is even bigger than that, then electrons can't stop it, neutrons can't stop it, and it goes straight to a black hole. That's a core collapse supernova. Actually, it blows up, and then the core collapses into a supernova, or into a black hole. So um, there's several types of supernova, again, depending on the mass of the star. Um, the supernova of 1054, uh, which created the Crab Nebula, was a core collapse supernova, but it stopped at a neutron star, which was a, it's spinning, so it's called a pulsar. And um, there are many more that are more massive than that, where the explosion, uh, after the explosion, the core collapsed into a black hole. So it's direct. It, it, there's not a increment where it kind of stops at each of these stages. It's always direct. It goes right to it. <clears throat> Hans, do we have any of these hydrogen helium only stars in the universe today? Or is it all star forming matter today? Recycled old stars. The vast majority are old recycled. And, they, and the way you know is by a measure of something called metallicity. For some reason. Anything over helium, astronomers call a metal. So if a star like our sun, which has like uh, 20, or I forget what the, the little pie chart I showed said, but stars like our sun have lots of metals in them. These are things in the periodic table that are above lithium. Okay. And that's called a high metallicity star. The more of those that you have, the higher the metallicity. 
And of course, these first stars that ever shone, all they had was hydrogen and helium. So they're called low metallicity stars. And we do see them today in the present universe in, I think, dwarf galaxies. And I don't understand why we still see them. I think because the um, they must have just formed straight from the from clouds of early hydrogen. But we've just reached my limit of my knowledge on that. So I'd have to look up anything more. Uh, yeah, I'm going to put you on. Hold on. We got... We got population three stars. Oh God! Which yes. uh, the sun is one, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And we got population two stars, which you're talking about, which we see low mixed metallicity stars, mm -hmm. and those are apparent in like the dwarf galaxies and that. And then we have population one stars, and those are the huge ones. That's right. Yes. Okay. And so, so we do not see uh, the population. Uh, oh, sorry. I, I think I have that backwards. No, yeah, I it's, do. It's it's, a, it's what what one? It doesn't go yeah, one two uh, three. <clears throat> it, it's, yeah, it's really stupid the way they've organized. These oh yeah, stars. yeah. So and population three it. stars are the really young ones, the the really huge ones, right? Is that uh, have, have I got that right? I don't know. I'd have to look. Yeah, I'd have to look. Yeah, uh, but from my recollection, is those really huge stars that we expect to see in the very, very early universe are the population three stars. Yeah, I don't know which, which one it belongs to, but you're right there. So but all I know and is we don't see population three really. stars. I think, well, okay. I'm going to defer because I don't know for sure, but I do believe we've seen low metallicity stars. I, I'm pretty sure about that. Oh, okay. We don't yeah, see Yeah, low miss metallicity, but... but Okay. Yeah. All right. Not with the ones with, that are purely hydrogen or with a small amount of lithium, right. those are population three stars. And we don't, well, I mean, I, as far as I know, we don't see those. Okay. I'll defer to you on that because uh, right now I just, yeah, I just don't know enough to say. I have to, it's one of the things where I got to look it up uh, to remind myself that it is. Um, Pyro's commenting again, inflation is a pet peeve of mine, stands out as a perfect example of ad hoc theorizing. If something in your theory doesn't come together, I'm more of a back to the drawing board kind of guy. I know. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And, and where they're putting inflation is changing. <clears throat> we just read an article recently in one of our T cubes a while back where inflation might have occurred before the big bang, right? It might've been a precursor to the big bang now. Um, but you're right. It's one of those things where we, apparently we need it. Uh, for the models that we have to work out the way they do, the universe doesn't end up being the way it is right now without it. Uh, so it's there, but it, I don't know if it's ad hoc. I mean, you know, they, they, they need it to be in there for the rest of the universe to look the way it does, but it is a problem. I agree. And, and whether we can ever observe it and see it, or I'm sorry, uh, have any, see any evidence of it, um, is, is, uh, up in the air. That's one of the reasons, remember Brian Keating um, was part of the BICEP2 mission who claimed that when they looked at the microwave background radiation, they saw echoes. They saw polarization echoes within the CMB that that inferred the existence of inflation. And so they, everybody was really excited. Nobel Prizes were being expected and all of this stuff, only to find out their data needed more work. So... Um, but it is, I don't know if it's, I wouldn't say it's ad hoc so much, uh, as it is, um, like when Einstein put in his cosmological constant, it needed to be there to have his theories work out. And then he took it out and then he realized, wait a minute, kind of, cause he didn't think the universe was expanding, but it, Hubble said, yes, it is. And so he put it back in. That's the kind of work that is it's analogous to that what einstein did with the cosmological constant is very similar to this inflation thing so um that would be my response to that um let's see uh, all of their names start with king oh sorry you're talking about something else there um let me let me scroll back up Archetufus. It's the age of the universe where stars and planets prance around on horses, wear plate armor, and swing swords around. That's right, the dark ages. <laughs> Yay, we! Uh, okay, I'm scrolling way up here. Um, oh, South Wales, how you doing? It's good to have you here. Moi, me, my, mine. 
<laughs> Finally made it live. So welcome. Uh, I appreciate your being here. So thanks for, sh thanks for showing up. I'm glad you're here. Um, okay. I think I've gone through most of that chat. So let me, let me scroll back down. Uh, Sebastian Clark's got a comment. Let me read this. Uh, skies darken as visible lights from distant galaxies recede while the observable universe grows. Um, we point our instruments ever deeper into the void and watch it brighten with ancient diffuse red light. Uh, the, observ the observable universe, I guess, does grow, but it also accelerates faster than that so it's actually the amount of the universe that we can see is actually going down i talked about that in the other uh, the stream i did last week um, because of the acceleration of the universe it's actually we're seeing less and less of it uh, over time so while the size of the observable universe the amount that light can because as the universe ages we can see light from slightly further away we're kind of stuck um at the three hundred eighty thousand. uh opaque part um that's never going to change so but the universe is getting bigger things are expanding away from us out of our field of view never to be seen again at a rate of about 160 oh, i forgot what it was now 100 I, I said it last week it was pretty cool that we went through an article uh from ethan siegel on this and if you if you would like to learn more check out his starts with a bang uh, article i think it was on bigthink.com and i also did a, a hangout on it just last week uh, let's see. Charlie's back. Good. Thank you. I should have you on. Why don't you get on the discord, man? And we could talk about, you sound like, you know what you're talking about. Population two stars are found in globular clusters. So tell us, tell us what the different pops are. They don't make, they don't follow any kind of order. They're kind of jumble around. That's what I remember about it, but I can't remember which are which and which is which, um, Pyro's got another question. Uh, the anything possible today was the most important part. It goes counter to the second part of the question, the idea because more density equals direct black hole. Instead, it's delayed. Okay, I'm sorry. Where's the, anything possible today? Because more density equals direct black hole. Oh, you mean the early universe was so dense that you could go straight to a black hole instead of being a star first? I'm sorry, I'm I'm not I'm not understanding what you're saying. Okay. So, so what he's saying is that in the early universe, these stars were so huge, and we can still have that happen now. Is that instead of having a supernova, they just blink out? That that's that's the the and, and they've had some instances of that happening, uh, or at least uh, candidates for that, where they just went direct uh, direct to uh, a black hole without the supernova and or what, the hypernova. What would be the indicator of that? A, a black hole of a certain mass? Would all of the mass of that, <laughs> that star then go into a black hole because the um, because there was no subsequent explosion or, or pre oh, yeah, because there's it, it, there's no there, there's no supernova. But there's a there's a uh, they had a couple I think in the uh, the large Mag uh, Magellanic cloud that just winked out. They were red giants, like our super red giants, and just gone. And that's what they expect uh, in the very very early universe that that could also happen. But I mean, I don't know how we're going to see that because you, when we're looking that far back, we're looking at quasars and maybe hypernovas. So I, I don't know if we would ever detect that. I don't see how you would either. Um, I'm doing a quick little Google search on this and I don't see anything. A massive star dies without a bang, revealing revealing the sensitive nature of supernova uh a star as heavy as this one 25 times mass the sun was supposed to go out in a fiery flash known as a supernova um here's what i'm looking at i'm looking at this 
Let me get rid of this. So I'm looking at, um, oh, I can't make it big because it's all messed up right now. But um, instead, it just brightened a little, then vanished, possibly leaving behind a black hole. No one had ever seen one of these huge red stars wink out of existence with so little fuss before. It was a sign that the lives and deaths of these stars are more complex than our simplest theories have claimed. And amazing and important and fun and exciting as this is, it's not a surprise, says Stan Woosley of University of California, Santa Cruz. In fact, the discovery may explain why the massive stars in computer models often fail to blow up. Conventional theory says that when all stars born uh, more than eight times as massive as the sun explode as supernovae. When they're young, the massive star is bright blue. Nuclear reactions in the core generate an immense amount of energy. This keeps the star so this keeps the star so that the gas pressure pushes outward and potentially counteracts the inward pull of the star's gravity. So yeah, that's how they shine. So does the pressure of the many photons streaming out of the star, star's core. As long as it generates energy, the star can hold itself up. In the end, though, gravity always wins. Later in life, as a massive star begins to run out of fuel, it expands. Stars born between 8 and 25 or 30 solar masses expand so much that their surfaces cool, and the stars become red supergiants. If the sun were as large as the largest red supergiant, okay, we don't need to know that. The uh, um, Then, according to standard lore, the star exhausts its fuel and its core collapses. The core collapse sparks a wave of neutrinos. These ghostly particles pass unimpeded through matter, but the collapse of the core produces so many neutrinos that they blast off the star's outer layers, launching a titanic supernova explosion. Okay, so that's what happens. But in recent years, observations have also begun to suggest that some red supergiants don't actually go supernova. Starting in 87, when observers saw a supernova in the large Magellanic Cloud, astronomers have been able to examine pre-explosion images of galaxies and identify which star exploded. By now, astronomers have performed 25 of these stellar autopsies, and as expected, most of the doomed stars were red supergiants, but they didn't span the full range of mass from 8 to 30 suns. We have almost no detections of stars above a birth of 17 solar masses. And these should be the brightest ones, the easiest ones, to find on images. He calls this failure the red supergiant problem. Uh, the, the disappearing supergiant of 2008 is a likely example. The star's home is a hyperactive spiral galaxy, 25 million light years from Earth, NGC 6946, which is infamous for its sundry supernova. From 1917 to 2017, astronomers saw 10 supernovae explosions there, more than in any other galaxy. But the supernova didn't hap that didn't happen could prove more significant than those that did. Um, okay, so there you go. I guess that, that speaks to what you're talking about. So this is here. Let me just give you this link. Here's the link, guys. Um, Put this on YouTube, YouTube, I guess. I can just choose which one. There's what I was reading. So you guys can, uh, and I'll put it on Twitch too. There we go. Uh, so is that what you're talking about, Pyro? Because um, I didn't know that. So I'm going to have to read this more in depth, but that's an interesting idea. That's a very interesting idea. Um, cool Worlds has a, a video about that. It's in a connection with uh, 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 Beetlejuice. They, uh, he was talking about what would happen if it did go uh, a supernova or, or, or if, end its life. And that it is a possibility that it could wink out, but it's probably too low in mass. I see. Okay. All right. Uh, that cool walls, by the way, is a really good channel. So that's, that's a really good, he makes awesome videos. So definitely, I'm, I'm have to check that out. It's been reported that 40 plus stars have simply disappeared. Could they be candidates for stars that turn straight into black holes? I guess so. Um, yeah, this is something I don't know a whole lot about. So I'm gonna defer to all of you guys on this one. See, this is why these discussions are so great. I like it that, you know, we can talk about these. I can learn things too. So, um,
but Galaxy is responding to that, saying, but that isn't turning straight into a black hole. Directly into black hole is mass, into black hole without come becoming a star first. Um, okay, so, so, all right. Okay, guys, well, this was fun. Thank you guys for participating. I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to head out here uh, soon. I will be back on Thursday. Um, I'm thinking. I'm thinking about doing a hangout on what the next interstellar mission from NASA might look like. As you know, we have um, we have. Voyager 1 and 2 out there in interstellar space now. Uh, it took a long time to get there. Uh, this was launched in 1979, so careers have come and gone over the time that Voyager was launched. Uh, Carl Sagan's come and gone uh, during this time. And so, um, but what about a new one? How, what, what might it look like? I've been thinking about this uh, after I read an article from NPR on this. It's a, it's a really good thing to think about. I might do that Thursday, but if I'm not ready, I'll have to pick something else. If you guys have anything you'd like to see or discuss, I don't want to drive this bus myself, but I'm happily, I'm happy to make up a little presentation with some slides. We can talk about it uh, at your um, request and we'll have a discussion after it's over. I'll do my best to put together a coherent discussion on a uh, presentation on it and then we can discuss it afterward so if you've got anything like that please let me know i'm happy to lend my experience into setting these up i don't always know the answer to everything that we're talking about but as we've seen today but i know enough to be able to know the right questions to ask and what's interesting and how to pick out the relevant part so at least i can contribute in that way so thank you all so much for uh, hanging in there with me. Thank you for watching these. I do appreciate you guys. And I think we really are actually building a community instead of just a cult. So it's fun that you're here and fun you're we're doing this. So I will see you guys on Thursday. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, keep looking up. <laughs>